Rebecca's original presentation was advertised as the weird world of financial fraud and cyber scams. But given the news over the past two weeks, she decided to add in bank failures as an extra topic. The U.S. Banking at Risk story started last week with two banks running into financial problems. First, Silvergate Capital on last week Wednesday announced that they were winding down their operations and liquidating. Silvergate was one of the banks serving the crypto industry. The following day, Silicon Valley Bank ran into problems because there was a classic run on the bank. They were unable to handle all of the requests for people withdrawing their money. And the bank lost over $160 billion in market value in 24 hours. So it was basically taken out of business by the state regulators on Friday. The big problem is that SVB had invested funds in long-term bonds at a time when interest rates were low. And of course, now they're much higher, so those bonds are just not worth as much. By Friday, Signature Bank also ran into trouble, again with customers withdrawing lots of their deposits. This led to the third largest bank failure in history. Of course, the largest one was back in 2008, was Washington Mutual. On Sunday, the U.S. Department of Treasury, the Federal Reserve, and the FDIC announced that in their takeover of Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank, they would make sure to reimburse all of the depositors. And they assured everybody that no losses will be borne by the taxpayers. Now, back to Rebecca's lecture. Quacky. Um, and people are saying, well, this is an anomaly. No, it's not an anomaly. It's, we, we know the stock market and all of these things fluctuate. It fluctuates. It goes up, it goes down. If you know what you're doing, which very few people do, if you know what you're doing, you can make money on the ups and on the downs. I'm not one of them. <laughs> but there are people who can make money going in either direction. But it's not an anomaly. You know? So one of the one of the books that I very much love and would recommend anybody uh, getting and reading is uh, The Black Swan, where um, the, you know, the author describes the phenomenon of the black swan well, the black swans are around us all the time. You just need to know how to spot them. So there are black swans in life, you know, actual swans, but also these anomalous conditions. And so, you know, he likes to track these guys. Uh, on Sunday, so they were working over the weekend, the uh, Department of Treasury, the Federal Reserve, and the FDIC announced their takeover of Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank in order to protect the depositors. Um, and their quote, let's see if, if we don't have to throw that in their faces, you know, going go some months and years down the road. They said no losses, at least with those two banks, will be borne by the taxpayers. So um, so that's basically what has been going on. And it doesn't really stop there. It crosses over the pond to what we call the ripple effect. If we go to the next slide, yes, questions. The reason they're saying no losses that are being borne by the taxpayers is because that means the banks can hire FDIC insurance now. So in the end, it's still a point that that means you're going to get. It, it's always borne by the yes, I agree with you. It's always borne by the taxpayer because any money that comes out of the federal government is coming out of us somehow. So, but it might be borne by uh, you know other entities or whatever. But yeah, it, it it's all coming back to us. But what they're saying, it's not. There's not going to be any direct increase, such as mandated, like you know, by the Congress. You know, to, to cover these losses that they're going to cover it, you know, with their own money magic. But you're absolutely correct. In that, that, that. So, um, so yeah, so it crosses over the pond. And on Wednesday, just uh, two days ago, 
Um, Credit Suisse shares lost more than 30% of their value after the largest shareholder saw the National Bank announced that it would not reject any more money. So other entities are becoming a little gun shy. They don't want to uh, provide any more money um, to try to keep profit these things up. Their price was already down 85% in February 2021. And Credit Suisse was able to respond to this crash by borrowing 50 billion dollars from Swiss National Bank. So everybody, everybody's like, okay, let's all share the disaster. So that's basically what's going on. Apparently Deutsche Bank, which used to be, Deutsche Bank was like, you know, they were the lender who would lend you money even if you had like no credit, stuff like that, you had to visit and things like that. But so Deutsche Bank found themselves on hard times as they were acquired by Zurich Bank in October of 2022, um, following the collapse of Lehman, uh, I'm sorry, when it was at its lowest asset level since 2008. Again, that 2008, you should look back to that if you want to see some other mimicry of what's going on. Following the collapse of Lehman Brothers Holdings, um, that is now seeing new deposits as assets are being moved from distressed banks. So they're sort of sucking up, you know, these losses. And it's like, well, all right, they pay while the sunshine will grab these at some cheap prices. So Deutsche, HBC, HSBC, and Santander announced that they are still willing to serve crypto clients. So crypto comes in to all of this. And this was interesting in the hearing that I, I just happened to turn it on on C-SPAN, and then I was fascinated by listening to the questions of Daddy on talking about all of this. Um, and she really would, she's so good. She, 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 she will answer with no answer at all, but it sounds like she answered her question. <laughs> she's quite amazing. So, so anyway, what's interesting, and, and they were talking also about marijuana. So one of the issues that the senators were bringing up from the marijuana states, we didn't hear it from, and from anybody in New Jersey, but like Colorado and the other states, is that um, because of federal regulations, you're not allowed to put marijuana-based cash into FDIC-insured banks. So for a while, I guess maybe this is even still going on, people were just renting large warehouses where they were storing cash from their marijuana businesses. But the problem is, is that there's all this cash that's sort of out of the cycle because it's based on this marijuana money that they cannot actually put into any FDI insured bank. So then there's these other, the other banks, you know, just the local banks or the ones that are out of the FDIC thing, they can put them in there. Um, but this is one of the things that the, uh, the, the senators were asking, are you going to change these laws? But that's the way, that's the way it is because federal aid matter is still illegal. So it's a, it's a very fascinating pile of interesting things that's going on. Yes. So I, it is a government dream. I think it is the FDNIC. Actually, just to look at that problem we're talking about, because there was some cash buying on the ground, they said, okay, so we'll take it and put the positive on your behalf. So that way, all this excess money is sitting around. That then pretty much became a situation for money laundering. So a lot of the cartels and other stuff started going into <laughs> So now they're essentially laundering money. So it's a big, so it's a big mess. It's a big mess, but it's not resolved as as of yesterday. Anyway, <laughs> it is not a resolved problem. So anyway, Corey, by the way, we're after my lecture. You're giving you're you're giving a lecture. So there's actually two lectures. They shouldn't have them at the same time. But there's two other lectures about crypto and you know, currency and stuff like that that are following this lecture. So stay tuned if you're, you know, or pop between the different videos. So they just have to get the same time. And by the way, if anybody wants to copy these slides, I have all my links and everything. So this brings us to a question. You can go to the next slide, please. Which is... Yeah, the links are really long. You can't copy them down. <laughs> Which is, is your money safer underneath your mattress? Or is it safer on the computer or in some sort of computational scheme that may possibly protect your money? So I don't know what if there is an answer to this, but in any event, 
it's always good to keep some cash safely on hand, maybe not necessarily in your mattress. Um, so in case of emergencies, does come into handy, especially when there's a power better. You can move on to the next slide. So, um, so the rest of this talk is actually the talk I was originally going to give, which I gave to um, a financial uh, cybersecurity conference down at the University of Maryland School of Business in January. So, but these, the, all of these statistics are, uh, have not really changed. So, but a lot of these statistics are from the first half of uh, 2022, because that's, uh, those were the materials that I was able to get. Um, it takes usually six months to a year to get new data on some of these types of statistics. So, as far as the first half of 2022 is concerned, U.S. consumers reported a record $3.56 billion loss to online fraud, nearly a 50% increase from the same period of the year earlier in 2021. Nearly 800,000 fraud complaints were processed by or were provided to the Federal Trade Commission. Um, imposter scans represented the highest percentage of reported cases with more than 361,000 complaints filed totaling 100, I'm sorry, 1.33 billion in losses. Investment-related scams were more financially damaging were than, than before with more than $2 billion lost, averaging $40,000 per victim. It doesn't mean that all victims lost that much money. It's just that some lost a lot of money, uh, but you know, but they, this was sort of a base average. So they didn't lose some small amount of money. You're probably not going to take the time or trouble to pursue it. Um, and check fraud and cyber scams <clears throat> intersect. So I'm gonna be talking about check fraud quite a bit here. I'm also gonna be talking about cyber scams and you'll see sort of the intersection between categorizations. And again, all this data was not made up by me. Um, I did a, you know, quite a bit of research to come up with this. So you can go to the next slide. And these came from Amazon. The slide in the next one. These are direct quotes from Amazon. How many of you remember in this past December receiving an email that looks similar to or sort of like this? Let's see if some of you are saying yes. When I gave this talk back in January um, to this um, to this pretty astute group at the University of Maryland, they, I would say about three, about two thirds of the people said that they were called this Amazon email. So I'll just sort of read from it. Stay safe from scammers this holiday season by getting to know the most common scams. So they talk about um, a bunch of different types of scams. They, they mentioned the border confirmation scam. It's sort of a text call or email. So this is what they're warning you about. And, and many of us have received these, obviously. They refer to an unauthorized purchase and try to get you to act to confirm this. I never confirm anything. So never hit okay, yes, don't say yes on the telephone. Don't do any of this type of stuff. They're really strict. It's really hard sometimes not to say something in the affirmative. Uh, when somebody calls you on the phone. So I, I get into the habit of saying, I don't know, or who are you? <laughs> so they used to pack up. So <laughs> they'll try to convince you to provide payment or bank account information, um, want you to install software to your computer or device or purchase gift cards. So these are some of the common scams you're wanting people about. And there's also tech support scams. Scammers are creating fake websites claiming to provide tech support for your devices and Amazon services, customers who land in these pages or lured to contact the scammer and call with schemes. Now, not only that, they could also inject malware into your computer or anything that could be happening. So you have to be really, really, really careful. Go on to the next one. And this continued. Um, these were their recommendations. So they had these three recommendations. Trust Amazon, of course, you know. How can you trust them? Somebody's using their logo. I don't even know it is them, but in any event, they said always go to the Amazon mobile app or website when seeking customer service, tech support, or when looking to make changes to your account. Hopefully, when you're typing that in to your browser, 
that you're going to the Amazon website and it's not being rerouted. But in any event, um, be wary of false urgency. There's always this, you know, oh, you need to do correct this right away or you're going to be charged or whatever. Um, so you must act now, something like that, to get you to do what they're, they're asking. And never pay anything over the phone. Amazon will never ask you to provide product information, payments, gift cards, verification cards, products or services. If you receive correspondence, you think may not be from Amazon, they be put to us. So obviously they were concerned about the holiday season that this had become so pervasive that they wanted to try to warn people about the types of things that are going on and make sure that they do not um, it. But it's it's difficult. It's really difficult because a lot of the stuff, you know, is contrived to look very very closely to to what a real official. Thing is. So so anyway, so that you know, so that brings us to to other types of fraud. So you get to the next slide. So these next sets of slides are all about check fraud. Now many people don't use checks anymore. I actually like checks. Checks, I think, are pretty cool. Checks are actually way more secure than ballots. So <laughs> checks have, if you, if you, <laughs> that's the, you're laughing because you know, voting is like my favorite pet peeve topic of, you know, my entire life. So, <laughs> so, and people are like, you know, oh, we have voter verified paper ballots, but they're just a stupid piece of paper. They don't have any of the authentication, but you can buy an entire, like, bunch of boxes of checks for like $20, you know, from these check making companies that have all sorts of security, like, like you know, 500 checks for like 20 bucks with all of these security features, you know, like the heat sensitive ones, you blow on it, you know, and it'll change color. You can look at it from the side, it might have a hologram. Some of some checks that you get nowadays, now again, a lot of people don't use checks anymore, but occasionally you'll get a check that will have some of these features on them. And it's a lot. There's a lot of different ways that they're trying to secure checks now. They don't use a single one of these microprinting, you know, I can just go on and on and on with all the different types of things they can use on these, but they don't use any of these on paper ballots. So if you think that those paper ballots are secure, they're not, because we know that we can make them more secure in many, many other ways. They cost nothing. I mean, we're talking pennies, maybe not even a penny per a ballot if they wanted to add some of these features. But anyway, um, check fraud, continues to remain the payment method that is most impacted by fraud activity. 66% in 2021, up from 60% in 2019. I don't, again, have any more updated statistics, but I can tell you that um, a check that I sent in the mail to, it was a, my physician, you know, just a regular check to pay for a uh, regular examination, they never received it. So checks are being, you know, taken out of mailbox. I don't know how they're being taken. I have certain certain post offices that I, that I feel are a bit skeptical now, so I only go to certain post offices. I don't like to hand my stuff over. Classic yeah. excuse that got lost. Yeah, very classic <laughs> excuse that got lost in the mail. And so what we're going to say, you know, with the check fraud, are there's so many different ways you'll see information, you know, in the additional slides. But there's so many different ways to have check fraud, which is why it seems like we're moving away from using checks. Although, you know, it's just whatever it is, the fraud is just going to move elsewhere. Um, but during the pandemic, mobile banking actually increased by 200% in new registrations leaving banks um, vulnerable to risk. So, so a lot of people were not doing mobile banking. They were you know, actually going to banks. So, so there was another type of uh, risk that banks were, were um, experiencing. So methods for prevention of check fraud include transaction analysis, which again, needs to be done on, on your side. I mean, I looked actually at my bank statements for a couple of months and I never saw that check come through. Um, the bank actually said, well, you can pay us $35. And then if the, that check does come in and it was changed to a different 
you know, recipient or a different value, then we will avoid it. But it's like, but why do I have to pay $35 for this? So I'm paying more money for nothing, essentially. But in any event, um, transaction assets uh, generally require looking for unusual or suspicious activities and deposits and withdrawals. And again, that can be done by you, but can also be done by the bank, such as out of range check numbers, weird dollar amounts, duplicate check numbers. The bank should be able to flag some of this. Um, so that would be an indication that there was you know, some focus stuff going on. Check image validation. So they used to, again, in my bank statements, they used to give me an image of each check. Now the banks are going away from that. It's too much trouble for them to take that image. So when I deposit checks, they will, on, at least still as of yesterday, <laughs> when you deposit it into an ATM, you can request a check image so that it'll print it out on your little ATM, which will, of course, fade because it's on that weird paper. So you should then photocopy that or take a picture of it. So in any event, that's comparison against historical check images for aberration. Now, this was me depositing a check, you know, for my business. So that, you know, so the other side would want to be concerned about that. Well, that's this way, at least I can say I deposited this check for however many dollars. And signature defect verification. Sophisticated decision trees provide detail analysis of checks and signatures. People's, um, as you get older, people's handwriting tends to change, which um, they used to have you sign in when you would go in person to go here in New Jersey. And, and actually, I used to be a poll worker in New Jersey, in Pennsylvania. It would be interesting because you could look at, you used to be able to, not anymore, but in the book where the person's name was, you would look them up in the book when they would come to vote. And you could see how the gradual change in their handwriting as they got older. Sometimes you could get more loopy, sometimes you could get more jaggedy. But you could still see the progression of that, but it still looked like their signature. Again, we're losing a lot of this historic analysis. Um, and I'm bringing us back to voting again, which is something with money, but it does have to do with fraud, um, election fraud, and we're losing this history of the way people used to sign checks. So anyway, these are things that um, can be done by you yourself if you're checking on things, or also by the bank. You can move on. So now, under check fraud, we're going to have a whole bunch of slides now that are each different types of check fraud. I'm not saying this is an exhaustive list, but it is quite a lot of different types of check fraud that exist. But again, you could extrapolate this out to other types of uh, financial fraud. So this one is called paper hanging. Paper hanging occurs when account holders intentionally write bad checks that can't be covered by the amount in the account. So the idea is that you establish an account, you're using it for a while, and then you write a check for you know, $1,500, let's say. But you only have, you know, forty-five dollars to the end, okay? So the, you know, it's obviously bogus because there's not the money in the account. So the person may have opened the account specifically for this purpose. In other words, they keep it open and they do a bunch of transactions, and then whoops, all of a sudden, whoops, so they may be leaving the country. If they can grab that money somehow out of the bank, even though it doesn't have it in there in that account they you know they grab the money and the country or go elsewhere they may be taking advantage of what we refer to as the float time so there is a period of time between when it's going to be checked and flagged and again you have to be very very careful about you know how to do this you're going to be a fraudster like this but basically there you know, there's a way of sort of setting up an account making it look legitimate making it look like it has money in it and then writing checks that may actually yield some money to that person, um, you know, maybe some other entity. Oops, I should go home. Um, but there may be a way of doing that. Um, it's getting more and more difficult, but but that's basically how it's done. So they're grabbing money and then they're leaving this, you know, in this broad scene. So now a number of businesses, and this has been for years now, that if you have a very low starting number for your checks, 
like they used to always have it being started like 100 or 200 when you open up a new account. And then a lot of businesses won't accept checks with those low numbers because they know those are new checking accounts and they could be both. So some businesses will not accept checks with low starting numbers. So you might want to ask for some peculiar starting number like 850 for your first check number when you open a new account. Knowingly writing checks on closed accounts. So you may have an account that you close, you know, that or the person may have an account that they close, but again, they still have the checks, so they can write a check on that, and that's considered to be a form of payment. So these are it's sort of a slippery way of doing it. It involves some timing, it involves a little bit of preparation, sort of knowing what you're doing, but this is this is the type of scam that's going on. You would think that this would not. Be able to slip by, but it still does. Okay, go on to the next. The next one, some of these are similar, but they're not exactly the same. Floating involves intentionally writing a check to take advantage of that delay, the float time, between when the check is deposited and when the funds are transferred. Okay, so I'm depositing a check for $1,500 into my bank account. And now I'm writing a check for $1,500 against that check, okay? But that original check that I deposited is fake. So it's so now the banks are a little more shrewd. They'll say your money hasn't cleared yet, so you can't take that, or they'll put the other transaction on hold. But there is that little bit of flip time that is sort of hanging around when there is the opportunity that the deposit this bogus check. So usually, again, it takes different bank accounts, there's multiple players involved, but basically the idea is to take advantage of that little flow time and see if you can grab money out that you know is never going to go in because they were expected that. So this may be done to take advantage of an extra day or two before an automatic payday deposit. And in fact, a bunch, in fact, a bunch of banks allow people who are working for companies that pay by automatic paychecks they allow people to actually get their money a little bit early, like one or two days early before the check is actually deposited. So there, it's a way of getting customers. So if you have automatic deposit from your paycheck from your company, there's a, they will give you, it's like they're giving you this sort of free loan for one or two days before your check actually comes in. But what if you got fired? They have no way of knowing that you didn't really get yeah, fine. Isn't it supposed to take it the Monday? You can't just deposit this money on Wednesday. It just doesn't show up until Friday. Right. But they let you cut the money, but the bank has it. Just they do the two day clearing. Right. But they're saying that but in this, it. It's, it comes in before the payday deposit. So right. it's a day or two before. So, in other words, let's say on Friday is when your check would ordinarily right. be deposited. And payroll runs on Wednesday. Right. And at the end of the day, they transfer the money to the bank. No, what I'm saying is, yes, they, they physically, I don't know what they do now. They took a disc, and walked to the bank with all the payroll, gave it to the bank, and that was the transfer of money. No, payday is on Friday. Yes. That's when that happens. It happens on Friday. Okay. You're saying that the that the payroll department is actually giving that money two days earlier. Right. And they, it's technically the two day clearing. There, uh, there's a two day but clearing on it. The trusted customer is the college. Therefore, they trust it. Oh, because really they're trusting it from the co Okay, I see what's going on. Okay. But, but, the, but the question I have is let's say you got fired on last Friday. That was from two weeks, three weeks prior. From three weeks prior. Right. So you would have earned it already. Oh, from the prior week's earnings. Okay, so that does make sense then. Okay, but but apparently this is something that also can have a slippery slope in, you know, what you're saying whether is it does make sense. Them. Right, whether or not you trust them. Right, so it's a possibility. Again, let's imagine it's a smaller company. I mean, yeah, like if it's CCNJ, sure, then the bank would know, you know, this is when our stuff comes in and stuff like that. So, okay, that's a good point. I didn't think about that. Yes, I didn't think that they would actually have that. There's that two day foot thing. But again, this this type of floating, you know, it's not always necessarily having to do with payroll, 
But if, if the idea is that you're creating the illusion of an amount that's in the account, which is actually in. And so again, the banks should be the ones, as you're saying, that track and flag the accounts that show patterns of check floating, and they should warn customers about this type of thing. So that's the type of thing that happens. Okay, go on to the next one. Okay, so the next one is called kiting. And kiting involves the use of two different accounts either by the same or different account holders. So in this scheme, a check is going to be written from one account and deposited into another account in order to create the illusion of a balance in the second account, okay? So this was sort of what I was talking about before. You know, all of these are very similar, but they, you know, they have slight differences. So then the scammer may withdraw the cash and just vanish or repeatedly claim checks between the two accounts. So checks are bouncing back and forth between these two accounts to take advantage of the flood time that's going on between them. So, you know, again, this involves a bit of collusion if you're not doing it, you know, all yourself, which it, theoretically you could do. Um, but basically, you know, it's it's just a way of doing it. And then obviously it doesn't have to be done with just two banks. It could be 10 banks. It could be a whole ring of them. And you're just sort of floating everything around and trying to, you know, just sort of create this illusion that there's money on the surface. Okay, go on to the next one. Next one is forgery. Forgery is actual forgery of the signature or of the deposit endorsement. In other words, on the back side, uh, although many people just use a stamp for that anyway. Uh, with signature forgery, um, people can, you know, you have some friends coming over your house, a babysitter, pet sitter, whatever. They find some checks lying around, find stolen checks, or possibly replica checks, ones that you know could be generated with your bank account numbers and stuff, um, would be used. And then the signature is forged, and then they may deposit the check and uh, use it to buy goods and their services. Endorsement forgery is, as I said, on the back of the check, so it's a forged signature for the individual who would be depositing the check. Some non-bank entities, in other words, there may be, you know, some sort of sleazy, we'll cash your checks for a small fee type of thing. So these sleazy companies see them in large cities that you bring in checks and they'll give you cash. And they may accept just endorsed checks and give you cash or, um, or you know, basically, you know, say that they'll, you know, provide you this, these funds. Often the forger will pretend to be the individual and then check, cash the check at a bank or a business. So it involves a little bit of knowledge. You have to know what the bank account is. You know, you have to have uh, you know some knowledge about this um, in order to do them one way or another. But basically, any checks that are floating around can be associated with. Okay, move on to the next. One. Okay, the next one is check theft. Check theft which, as I said, can involve blank checks, such as to be used in check forgery, which I just said, or checks that have been issued by the account. So there's a couple of different types of things here. Counterfeiting is when a fraudster orders or fabricates blank checks using an account number that belongs to someone else. So it's basically, they have your account number when you gave them a check. So now they can get New checks with your account number, and they have your signature, you know, on the check that you gave them. And now they're creating more checks that they're going to use to access your bank. So, okay, so that's that's real counterfeit. And then what I think the, the concern was about my doctor's check, the, you know, that I had sent, is that there's a lot of this that's going on now called chemical alteration or wash. And again, I use the type of checks that supposedly won't be able to, you know, it'll, it'll be noticed if, the, if some of this chemical alteration is going to occur. So if a check is stolen, or even, as I say, legitimately received, but then it's changed. So let's say that check was for, you know, $150 to my doctor, then I want to change it to $1,500, okay? So then I do some application of chemicals, and then you know, all of the areas to reflect different information, such as the recipient's name or the payroll. So obviously not going to be going to my doctor or go to someone else or whatever, then we'll sort of give them a check. So these are just, again, some of the mystifying ways that we create 
all of these illusions of legitimate checks that do not really exist. Okay, a couple more. <laughs> Go to the next one identity theft. Identity theft is any attempt to impersonate someone using their personal details. So let's say somebody wants to open up a bank account in the name of Rebecca Mercury. So they send some female in to open a bank account, or they can even take over my existing bank account using stolen personal information, and maybe some bad checks will be then written from that account. The scammer then vanishes with the bank having to deal with the unsatisfied check amounts. They might use your social security number, or social security number to tie in the policy to banking nowadays. Um, but social security numbers are very easy to take it. It's not very difficult to do really get them. Um, and the person whose identity was compromised might then be contacted by the bank and now has to prove, and this is where they get themselves into a lot of um, worry and troubles, having to deal with proving to the bank that no, I never opened this bank account, I didn't do this fraudulent transaction, blah, 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 blah. So that's the type of thing that now falls into actual identity theft. These other ones is these people are using their own or maybe their own fake identity to move money around, but this is where they're actually using your identity. Think about it. Five years ago, someone tried to collect my three month check from the IRS. Really? Yeah. Oh, no. That's the IRS caught us and didn't do it. Whoa. Well, but now they, we have a, a, a pin every year gets sent to us. Really? 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 So that's really interesting. So do you have any idea how they. No. No, no. no. I, I think the giveaway was they filed it December 31st. Really? Wow, that's really they tried to get it right away. They tried to get it like immediately. Oh my goodness, that's what they said. Right, so they were trying to get money back that you might come to. file and they claim all kinds of stuff. So they get these refunds. That's fake. Yeah, so they were claiming all these medical expenses or whatever. They can make it. So they actually filed an unpleasant insurance. In your behalf to try to get one. Yeah. Oh my goodness. That's really scary. That's really scary. That's really scary. That's really scary. A tidbit of information I learned recently that might help out. Um, I, I don't know about the rest of you, but I have a lot of passwords. So I use a password manager. Yeah. And I always use the god awful thing and have password manager saved. And the problem is, is someone gets your main password to the password manager. The password to the password manager, they right. have all your passwords. You can always worry about that. But now it's for you to on the phone. That's Yeah. Yeah, I only use the local one. Here's a fix to this, and just learn this recently. Use the dot off and have it go for that account or whatever. Right. And then change the password. You need to got off the password to add a, a phrase or a small word that you that is yours, power. yeah. So that your password manager doesn't have that addition again. And so oh. if they steal all the passwords, they still don't work. So they still won't work. Okay, so it puts it in the box and then you type in this and other you type in extra word. word or yeah, the word or whatever it is. So, okay. so it's so that, that, it's that yeah. plus this messy other thing that you the only person. Yeah. 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 Right. The database in of itself is still going to be encrypted. So the real thing would be the one if you take your master password and have it somewhere on your computer, or two, the person actually infiltrating would have to have access while it's going. Right. Well, the line of scan you see are the old ladies. Being, clicking on the email and tell, oh, you're oh, yeah. infected or you owe the IRS a bunch of money. Right, well, and they yeah. send remote control on your machine. Or this, this and app when they blank out your machine or whatever, yeah. They go to your bank account, which automatically locks on. So if you do this, that won't happen. That won't happen. Yeah. Because it'll come up, they'll try to do it in the wrong password. But you have to add this little bit on the end. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. All right, that's good. This is good. I'll add them to my slides and I can just talk to you. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right, next one. 
So now we're into this is sort of the final group of possibilities. I mean, there's plenty more, but I just threw a bunch of these out there so you can see the sort of subtle differences. And this is in the arena of fake paychecks, lottery payouts, money orders, and cashier's checks. So in these schemes, the fraudster is going to entice the victim to believe that they're receiving money as a gift. You know, that's we've all seen these. A lottery win, work performed. It can be very scammy with work performed because people think they're doing some work and they're going to get some money back. Um, an accidental overpayment or refund, purchase, et cetera. So then the victim is enticed to provide some of that money back in the form of cash or goods. What I really hate is these aiding things where you go into, you know, you have to log in and agree that you're going to be in some sort of, um, you know, meeting that you know you're responding to, you know, or like a party or something like that. And then they always have this scam of, you know, I don't think it is a scam with these entities, but to me it seems like a scam that, you know, oh, we can give you a discount for such and such or whatever. So so I don't like any of those sorts of things that you have that that you have to sign up for something and then they give you all these other, you know, give us some money and we'll give you some other things. Uh, after they deposit the draft, they learn that it's fraudulent, and then whatever they did for this in order to get this money, they them. So this is sort of a sort of a you know like a luring in type of thing that you're sort of you know it makes it seem like this was a legitimate thing, and maybe it even was, but you know it's it really was intended to. Be so again, just smell those when they happen and just stay away. Yes. So, is there any way that you can have a phone system a special rate for any phone call that comes from overseas with the internet? I expect that there should be. Yes, it should, should be. be. And yeah. uh, all of these scam phone calls that we get are overseas. Right. And, 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 oh, and this is great. And you tell to the accents of the people and everything. I mean, it's just ridiculous. And the, 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 They just so you know that's what's happening. So, so yeah, push the politicians to have overseas calls have a different rate. Have a different rate to them. Yeah, yeah. That would definitely. You don't even actually need to be concerned with themselves. You don't need to tell them that they tell them to cancel the company. Right. Necessarily have to be. Well, like she right. said, they're actually just choosing to block them. Right. And, and right. once it comes to the end, come the United States place. Um, basically. Yeah. And also. Right. So the ones yeah, that are really annoying to me right now are the ones that have my area code and the first three digits of my phone number. You know they're a scam. It yeah. is. Although it could be a neighbor, but <laughs> most likely it is a scam because all my neighbors have cell phones now that have nothing to do with you know the area code of where we have to live. So, so cool. yeah, but that's but that's another one that makes it look like it's something in. Local area, so. Yeah, those those calls are usually not international. They're actually uh, using voice over IP, so they're just logging into a voice over IP solution okay. using local numbers. Good luck lobbying. Okay, move on to the next one. Okay, so now we're into uh, quasi solutions. So protect yourself and your business. Uh, one thing is be careful who you buy buy checks from. So there are a few legitimate companies that sell all these fancy. Checks. There are also your banks, but they don't actually usually have the best security on those bank checks that you know that they, the ones that they will sell you. Um, and also, they're going to charge you like four times or maybe even ten times as much as for all these other legitimate companies. So there's a few companies out there that will have these features. So, uh, as I say, the features that I have on my check, business checks, personal checks, all checks, um, have holograms, sensitive markings. Chemically sensitive paper, microprinting, security backgrounds, and color changing areas. And you'll notice that on your government checks, if you do get a refund from, you know, buy a check from the federal government, you look at it. It's all very interesting. My company does a lot of work for the federal government, um, you know, our forensics work. So we do get checks like that. So I, I'm always looking at what are they now doing to keep stolen checks to make them more secure. We well, rarely use paper checks. Anymore. What's the problem with the digital checks? I 
I'm not saying there is a problem with digital checks. I just prefer to use regular checks. Although lately, I'm just calling any entity, they're all, they've all now made it free. Used to be like if you wanted to pay by phone, like your electric bill or your cable or any of that sort of stuff, you had to pay an extra fee. They now realize the advantage is that they got the money from you earlier. So they've all dropped all their fees. Even even your mortgage. You can pay your mortgage, any of these types of check, checks that I normally would send out. So I was yeah, so it's reducing, yes, we'll do it, all that sort of stuff. It's reducing the number of checks that I actually write, making it much more minimal. But the problem is, and it's also an interesting thing, is that it recognizes the phone that I call it in on. So when I call again, it'll say, oh, I recognize blah, blah, blah. And then you have to give some other identification. So, so we are migrating away from checks. But if you're still interested in using checks, uh, we use them in the board project because every student who gets their amateur radio license, oh, at the end, I'll mention about the board projects about amateur radio licensing. At the end, uh, when they get their license, then we send them a little kit. But in that is a check from IAAA refunding the cost of them getting their license from the FCC. So we use a lot of checks in IAAA. IAAA has a very long, ridiculously long check. It's very insane. But anyway, um, examine your banking credit card statements frequently, read it or report a statement anomalies, missing checks, checks you don't recognize. Who's going to do this every day? I mean, when I had that missing check, I went to the bank and they're like, well, you're going to have to check every day. I said, I don't have the time to do that. I'll miss every check once a month. So <laughs> I'm still only checking once a month. You can enroll in a protection plan, and I have been in my business and I are in LifeLock. We've been in LifeLock for five years. Not that we've never had to use it, but I have it. It's inexpensive, and that's right, that gives you some level of protection. Um, you can use email and phone spam filters, and you should purchase and keep. Uh, don't use free antivirus and firewall software. Actually, go ahead and buy it. The free stuff is also garbage. Okay, or can be. Okay, next slide. Don't, don't do these following things. So, as I said, just say no, hang up, hit the lead, don't engage with spammers. And one of my favorite thing to say to them is, why are you doing this? There's so many other good jobs you could have. Then they immediately hang up on me. So, <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to say. My they, son does a really good idiot. <laughs> That's scary. That's good. Don't leave blank checks and credit cards lying around. Respond to all of this is done. Respond to phishing attempts um, and surveys by providing personal information. They use credit card sneaky social security number, account usernames, pins, or payments to unknown, untrusted individuals or entities. Don't print or write personal information on checks. Some places won't accept checks that don't have an address on it. It's like really bizarre. So it's just been getting weirder and weirder. But you know, I don't like to have an address on my business. Don't accept checks for more than your selling price. So if you're at a business, or let's say you're at a flea market and you're selling somebody something for $100, you should really get cash from them. <laughs> That's what we do at flea markets. But let's say someone says, oh, I have to give you a, a check, but let me give you it for $110 and then you can give me Ten dollars in cash or whatever. Don't do that. Then you know it's a criminal scam. Don't um, accept jobs or gifts without independently checking the stores. So they'll contact you about some sort of survey they want you to do, and they'll give you some. Um, click on. Don't click on our open attachments and links automatically. I have all my links. It's all defeated. That it will not click. It will not open anything. Movies, pictures, whatever. The only thing I see in email is just text, and then I have to click on stuff. Don't respond to suspected fraudsters directly. Um, there was this grandchildren thing where somebody would call pretending to be your grandchild or somebody being you your grandchild, and oh, they've been arrested, and blah blah blah, and they need some money. Um, you know, they need this money right away. That, that used to go on a lot. I haven't heard of it that much anymore, but catfishes are out there everywhere. You know, anybody who dates online is insane, and all these sweethearts scams. So 
Don't do any of that. I mean, can't it's really, you know, I've been single for a long time. I was married for a long, a long time and now I've been single for a long time. So even to this day, some well-intentioned friends will sometimes say, well, why don't you check out, you know, like our time or, you know, one of these, you know, websites for like older people. I'm like, really? Really? You think, given the job that I have, I would go on any of these websites? It's like, no, I don't trust that one. <laughs> right. I'll take my chances. Yeah, bad chances. On. Don't pay any ransoms if somebody's trying to um, get into paying a ransom or they're going to, you know, take your dog or something, I don't know, whatever. Contact law enforcement. And don't make financial transactions of the support of your network. Um, going to conferences is is a place where your passwords and things can be stolen. Um, the hackers conferences that um, used to go on down in Las Vegas, I don't you know if they're still having them. Um, but they would routinely break into um, the ATM machines of the hotels where the people were staying, and you know all sorts of crazy stuff would go on at some of these hacking companies. Yes, um, shredding. Shredding. Oh yeah, shredding. Yeah, shredding. Shredding. I was driving the work ten years ago. Shredding. Got behind the trash truck, watching the trash man picking up a bag, seeing an envelope there, ripped it open, took the envelope. Whoa! Wow! Wow! He took this. This is the trash guy himself. He was harvesting stuff out of the trash. There you go. Yeah. Shredding. 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 Okay, that's good. Good point. Okay, so go on to the next one, and this next one is do. Use secure passwords and mobile step verification. We're talking about that. Change passwords at irregular intervals. Don't do it at, you know, a regular interval necessarily. Here's some recent information on changing passwords. Um, they, they prefer to do a really strong password, not change it, than change it a lot. My fact, change it a lot. It's yeah. just change from 180 days to not have. Really, yeah, because I was going to say that when I was teaching, um, I was teaching up at Drew, and they really had this, yeah, to keep changing their passwords. There was some research. So maybe it's actually. Your password, you're going to pick something that's guessing. Right, right. But it is, don't change your password and have it really long. And my habit was to have There's two passwords, which I would wrong. alternate between the two. Because <laughs> <laughs> just as bad, really. Yeah, that's that's I was waiting for that email to have to change my password, uh, and I never got it. And I was just like, what's going on? Why am I not getting this email? I'm just like, did, did I miss it? Am I going to be locked out of my account one day? Yeah, they only give you like 10 days. Wow. Yeah, when they email you, they tell you, hey, you have this many days to do it. To do it, you have to do it. Mm -hmm. And if you don't do it, you have to go to help. Right, then you have to go to help. I live in Philly. Yeah, yeah. So here's the shredding, destroying financial information, done securely. Be skeptical of any requests. Always think before asking. Some of these, you know, it's it can be they can be really pretty sneaky. So you have to be careful. Display and review the full headers. You know, you only get look normally at the partial header and you want to pop the whole thing open, then you can see where it really comes from. Of any emails that are suspicious. Check your credit reports annually. It is a good thing um, to do that just once a year. But uh, usually you have, a, you know, there's usually like three of them, whatever it is, Experian, you know, the different ones, Experian. But, and there you go. <laughs> and, but don't do them all in the same month. So do it, you know, stagger it so that right. that one. Do one a year, right? Yeah, you don't want it here. So don't do them all on January 1st. You know, start it up around. And then look for any onion deaths that might pop up. And for businesses, it's very important to maintain internal controls and separation of duties, monitor transactions and active account alerts, and periodically assess for this. Again, it depends on what type of business you're in. So pop over to the next slide and. Another 
Now two questions. <laughs> Let me get five years. Uh, email. Hit the next slide. One more. An old yeah. one. Emails with all caps. Emails with all caps. Yes, that was back. In and day. emails with misspellings. Yeah. And that's, but that still goes on. That's still. Uh, well, it goes so. on in presentations because the correct spelling for weird is W. <laughs> E-I-R-E. <laughs> but I myself personally always spell weird, weird. <laughs> so that's my personal. <laughs> exactly. That, that was deliberate. That is deliberate. That is deliberate. And, it, and people who get emails, exchange emails with me, know that I always sign my emails a certain way. So that that way I know it's my email. I don't know if you covered it. I had some experience with saying I sent a check to my son and her brother. And my sister, Matt, was manager. So I 